Hi, I'm LeVar Burton, and this is LeVar Burton Reads. In every episode, I handpick a different piece of short fiction and I read it to you. The only thing these stories have in common is that I love them, and I hope you will too. Today, the story is by the author Stephen Graham Jones. Now, he is the New York Times bestselling author of nearly 30 novels, collections, novellas, and comic books. And as you might expect, he's won a big old stack of awards, like the Texas Institute of Letters Award for Fiction and the Bram Stoker Award. His most recent books are The Only Good Indians, Night of the Mannequins, and My Heart is a Chainsaw. Wow, what a title. Stephen lives and teaches in Boulder, Colorado. Now, the story I'm going to read today appeared in the anthology about psychic warfare entitled Psy Wars, Classified Cases of Psychic Phenomena, edited by Joshua Viola, and it was also reprinted in Lightspeed. It's going to take you on a ride. I mean, truly, we are following the thoughts of a spy who has jumped out of an airplane and is hurtling through the air, ready to breach a federal facility and retrieve secrets using only telepathy. <laughs> like I said, it's a ride. I was drawn to it initially because I myself have enjoyed a bit of skydiving in the past, but I stayed because this character and his motivations are just fascinating. Please check out the content advisory that's in the written episode description if you are so inclined, and if you're ready, let's take a deep breath. And begin. To Jump is to Fall by Stephen Graham Jones. The ceiling for a jump without oxygen is 14,000 feet, give or take a football field or two. I step out of the plane at closer to 18, with the idea I can hold my breath for 4,000 feet of terminal velocity, at 10 seconds for the first 1,000 feet, and about 5 seconds for each 1,000 feet after that. That should mean no more than half a minute of anoxia. It should be a snap, except for the neural disinhibitor misting through the dendritic space of every thought I'm trying to have, every half a thought, every sliver or glimmer of a wisp of a thought. The disinhibitor is great, don't get me wrong. All the shackles fall away. The mind can finally overclock like it's probably been wanting to do since humanity stepped out onto the savannah. The image I got during orientation was a coked up hamster on a wheel, going faster and faster until the blood from its paws is a spray, striping the wood chip floor, then back wall, then clear ceiling, then front wall of its habitat. That hamster is in my head now. It doesn't make me smarter, I wish, but the latent telepathy we're all born with and never have access to except to call it instinct, it manifests, it unspools, it reaches out for whoever it can hook into, meaning that for the whole climb up, the pilot's skull was, to me, glass. Reading minds isn't like watching words appear in glowing letters on a board, either. There's no scroll, no crawl, no subtitles. I don't think mind-to-mind -mind really needs language, even. It's more like rubbing a dry sponge against a wet one. What I sponged in from the pilot 
It was not exactly the song blasting in his earbuds. Music, I'd been told, would keep his mind too busy for me to crack into. But what that song was carving up from his memory, a concert he'd been to when he was 15. And not just that, there was another kid in the mosh pit, too far off to ever jam into with a shoulder, but the pilot hadn't wanted to. Didn't know what would happen if he did. That sweaty, bare-chested kid jumping and slamming and losing himself in the music, his mouth and lips locked in a constant mute roar. It was the pilot, which made me knee-jerk think this was a memory, maybe. But from whose point of view, right? Or was the pilot's angle back on himself a kind of condensation of the whole experience? Did he have this kind of angle and distance because he was half a life older already, always receding more and more from the punk kid he'd been? I'd been warned not to believe everything I read from somebody's head, to ignore everything but the data, the information, but still, right? The way the pilot had been dwelling on this, it it was... He was flying the plane at the same time. He was losing his sense of self in that mosh pit. But he'd been losing himself in that mosh pit at 15 as well. And I wasn't sure he ever really left that moment. That wrongness of seeing himself across all the craziness through the haze of whatever he'd been on. The way software has a kernel. This mosh pit was my pilot's kernel made me wonder what mine might be. Trying not to think like that, I turned my head to the side, my left ear to the roar of the wind, and even though I knew not to, I nearly tried to gulp some air in. (laughs) No. Some cold. Would my lungs frost on the inside? shatter in my chest. I straightened back up, leaned into the dive. Be a bullet, not a sail, trying to relish what I'd never known to be so pleasant before. The solitude of my own and only my own thoughts. Fifteen hundred plus jumps and I'm just figuring that out. Yeah. Probably 600 of those on the military's dime, but the rest on my own after I was processed out. My middle initial is P, and whenever I can work it in, I claim that it's for plummet, meaning I was born for this. It's really Peter, after my dad, but who cares? For all intents and purposes, this is my first jump where my mind is billowing out well before the silk does. It's like falling into myself. Like I'm in a tunnel, in an impossibly tall silo with a giant fan at the bottom. The blades whirring so fast they're pushing me up, 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 giving me seconds, drying my mouth out, my eyes crying in my goggles, not from the wind, but the pleasure. They're paying me to get doped up and do this, but I'd have paid to do it. Never mind that the facility I'm dive bombing is federal. Don't get me wrong, I'm no terrorist, and I don't hold some grudge about the missions I can't talk about. I don't even care about politics. It's just how there's ski bums trading bunny slope work for a lift ticket for the day. How there's climbers living in their cars at the base of the rock face just so what they love can be closer? I'm that way with the sky. I'm that way with falling through it at 200 miles per hour, my air brakes just a ripcord away. And all I've got to do for an infinite jump pass? Now, for a lifetime of air below me, is nab one network key when this federal facility comes into my telepathic range, which is supposed to be about a quarter mile, though nothing's exact here. There's more working parts to this heist than just me, too. 
on the ground at the facility minutes before I jumped. While the pilot was still climbing us higher and higher, his head bobbing with the song piping into ears, a sarin gas alarm ended up on some control panel. The result was a fire drill. Everybody out. The sarin gas is only for the alarm, of course. Enough to register, but gone before it can do any harm. It's just how my check signers are clearing the facility of the mental chatter associated with too many people in one place. In the case of a biological weapons dispersal at a federal facility, same as everywhere, probably, you run away. Everybody scatters. Except, in the case of this facility in particular, there's always five administrators in the tower. Five administrators whose rooms lock down. Cycling air in from tanks, no sarin gas can make it in there. One of those five is supposed to be the head honcho of the IT department, who's the only one with today's network key cycling through the back of his mind. The way to get it to the front of his mind is simple. A phone call on his private line asking him straight out, Um, hey, you do have that network key, don't you? He hangs up, looks around suspiciously, but all the same, He's now thinking of exactly the string of numbers and letters and symbols we need. To get everything synced up perfect, this pre-recorded call isn't even triggered until my altimeter broadcasts that I'm within range. As for why I don't just mill around in the parking lot, try to grab the key from his head that way? Number one. The neural disinhibitor agent is making me bleed from the gums and nose and ears and eyes and the lining of my esophagus. The neural agent is not FDA approved, will never be mass produced, but all the same, since it came from this facility I'm hurtling towards, they've got the ground fenced off for three miles in all directions, and the guards shoot first, ask questions never. The number two reason I'm falling from the sky instead of skulking around the parking lot is that there's a device all high-level personnel wear clipped to their belts that can transmit a blocking frequency against temporary telepaths like me. But those buzzers only go active when and if there's ever any unauthorized access, not just in the building, but on the grounds. So... Say I somehow magically breached the fences and sensors and rifles. I'm just milling around in the parking lot with the rest of these fire drill evacuees, just generally bleeding from the head and causing a stir. No ID badge clipped to my shirt. What happens as soon as somebody clocks me as the danger I most definitely am is that every person in the facility with important data committed to memory feels a certain telltale hum at their waistline. And like that, I'm firewalled out, collecting zero pay. And this pay? <sighs> One jump, and I'm set for life. Medical included. Any injuries I incur from a late pull, any lingering effects of the neural disinhibitor, they're all paid for, even if they go chronic. Even if they're psychological or emotional, my parachute here is seriously golden. Yes. And this isn't even morally compromising work. Not really. As they explained it to me, nothing committed to paper, all of it piped into the room I'd been invited into. This network key isn't from nuclear codes or intelligence officer names. Nothing like that. It's just the key that unlocks the location of a certain black facility. One of those off-the-maps, dark, wet-worky kind of places. Those detention and torture centers with incinerators down the hall. Those places the Geneva Convention will never know about. That the whole world should know about. I'm not political, no. 
There's no politics at 4,000 feet and falling, but I do have a basic sense of right and wrong. And one minute of work for a lifetime of freedom? Who wouldn't say yes to that? All I had to do was swallow a pill under supervision of a medical team, and then do what I'm always doing anyway. Jump out of a perfectly good plane. Now, let's get back to our story. As for my training, there weren't any rip cords or tethers or how-to videos, and the training didn't involve conditioning my dormant telepathic capabilities. As I understand, there's no working out those muscles. All my training involved at first was a deck of cards and playing some blackjack for Halloween-sized candy bars. For four days, I memorized where the ten was, what the jack was doing, my heart jittery with sugar. After that, I graduated to flashcards, face down on the table, which I could look at for, at first, five seconds, then four, on down to just a glimpse. Initially, the number was two digits, then more, then some letters and symbols mixed in, and this last night, an impossible 16-digit and character jumble gone almost before I even saw it. The team didn't expect me to remember each number and letter and symbol individually, they assured me, but did want me to focus on the shape of the whole string. The contours, the rises and falls, the dips and drops, the sharp walls and fast valleys, and how wide those valleys were, or weren't, and whether their floor was flat or bumpy, which could be the difference in an E and an N, an A and a U. As they explained it, there wouldn't be time falling out of the sky, the ground less than a quarter mile from my face and coming fast for me to build anything as fancy as some memory palace, which they also had to explain to me but I would be able to take a mental snapshot. I could get the shape of the network key before that IT admin's belt hummed on. And working within the general confines of that shape, there would be exponentially fewer combinations of numbers and letters and symbols that would fit. If they were lucky, they could use that shape to crack the key before the clock reset it and stop all manner of human rights violations from revving up. Easy as that. I get paid whether they're successful or not, and I don't have to take the disinhibitor again, only see my team again at whatever local medical facility I get delivered to, all of which they have stuffed with their operatives, so I can sketch the shape of the network key all secret under my order for Jello or ibuprofen or whatever. Like I say, who wouldn't sign on this dotted line? Technically, now, falling. 3,000 feet. 2,500. I'm not even working, I'm just commuting to work. The job part of this doesn't even start until I get close enough to the tower to soak up the general shape of 16 digits, numerals, and symbols. Cake. All the way down, man. Because it's so easy, is why, I guess. I'm halfway paying attention to what's going on in the bleary edges of my peripherals. I'm not worried about counterinsurgent ordnance, nothing fancy and over the top like that. I'm just, you know, drifting. 
looking at all the pretty stuff, like, say, my drop plane, puttering off into the horizon. I lift my hand to wave by to the pilot, thank him for the lift. It's a stupid gesture, but who's watching? And that's when the plane, framed between my thumb and index finger, explodes. It was already trailing smoke, which was supposed to look all in distress. That was why I'd had to emergency jump into restricted airspace. But the pilot had his story for when he landed, wherever he landed. I'd heard him being put through the paces of it until he had it down. Meaning... No way did he know there was an explosive under his seat. No way did he know his concert was coming to such an abrupt end. I spread my arms and legs to slow my descent, maybe think this whole thing through again. So, so they'll cash in a plane for this network key, got it, and they'll snuff out a human being just the same. How long are they going to need me after I trace the shape of that network key, right? And that's even if I survive the fall. Deploying a chute as close to the ground as I'm about to, well, first, it isn't a standard chute, not even close. Chutes are designed to open slowly, so as not to rip their harness up through the body of the jumper. They're not designed to jet up and out on invisible struts of compressed CO2. At 400 yards from the big splat, I won't have the luxury of a soft whoosh. My chute might be colorful and pretty, but that's just so that when it's on the ground in disarray, nobody will question it. It's designed to stop me nearly instantly, though. Nothing soft about it. It's going to be only minimally better than hitting the ground. I know, and have been warned about it. Never mind the custom harness, the extra padding, all the body armor and braces on under my jumpsuit. When I rip my cord, I'm going to get stopped hard enough mid-fall that no way am I conscious for touchdown. All part of the plan, of course. Get the knocked-out, bleeding, off-course skydiver to the hospital. Stat. Never mind what I'm smuggling out in my short-term memory. Then, the alarm in my helmet chimes same chime that was always coming on at random times during all my blackjack games of the last few days. Pavlov's dog that I am, my mind opens like a hungry flower. As designed, the IT admin is the first mind I slurp in. His name doesn't matter, just what he's trying and trying not to think about. It's not It's not a network key. Surprise, I say to myself with zero surprise. What's at the front of his mind is a girl, seven, maybe eight. She's in the front yard of a bland suburban home, just doing nothing. But then everything goes pale around her. House and trees and sky all wash out. Everything except the street name on its green sign, and the number painted on the curb. And what I now realize is the same font on that deck of cards. His daughter. His hidden by the government estranged daughter. Hidden so she can't be used against him. Can't make him reveal secrets. My check signers don't want the key... They want the guy who has the new key every day. And now, they'll have him. When his belt device hums on with my aerial intrusion, the frozen image of his daughter turns to static, then snow, and like that, she's gone, sucked back into his head. But not fast enough. I have maybe a tenth of a second here, a hundredth, a sliver of a slice. I can pull the cord, black out, 
wake a rich man. Or... I'm not a good person. I've never claimed to be. But... And I can see it now. I think this is why I dive. Why I jump. Why I fall. I still remember my estranged father tossing me up into the tiny sky of our backyard. Tossing me higher and higher, then standing on the grass below me, his hands open to catch me. If this girl, his daughter, if she hadn't been sitting on that same grass, then maybe i pull my ripcord, let my canopy snap open. But she was where she was, and I am who I am. And her father was trying so hard not to think of her, wasn't he? Just the harder he tried, the more she came into mental focus for me. The whole climb up, my pilot's skull was glass. Mine isn't, is just bone, but just to be sure it shatters like it needs to. Instead of pulling my ripcord, what I pull is my helmet's chin strap, so that when I hit, my short term goes with it, splashes all around. It was a good jump, though. And, to be honest, I kind of always wondered what it might be like. My chute didn't open. I'm coming home, Dad. Catch me. Please. I love a a good stream of consciousness story, a good first person. Let me tell you what's going on in this now moment, Yarn. A bit of an unexpected ending, which I love. I love the decision that he made, of course, but, but the way he came to it, right? The idea that, 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 that the first, his first clue was the plane that brought him up exploding in the sky, you know, and they've lied to me, and, and am I going to continue to allow myself to be a, a tool, a pawn in their game, or am I going to go out on my own terms? Am I going to determine um, my destiny in, in this moment and, and, and do the right thing or, or do the altruistic thing? You know, the, the character strikes me as such a, a sort of a self-sure cocky individual that I love the turn he makes when choosing this girl in her relationship with her father over his own um, existence, right? Living out his dream, free air underneath him for the rest of his life. Although I suspect that as he gets closer and closer to that moment of decision, um, with his eyes and nose and esophagus bleeding, I think he comes to the decision that he's not really going to survive this after all, you know? Um, there's also the other aspect of it, though, for me. Um, what falling or what jumping out of a perfectly good airplane really means. What, what is that a metaphor? for in our lives? What leaps into the unknown are we willing to take in our lives? And in the service of what, right? Is is risk only worth it when it benefits ourselves or is there value in risking for the benefit of others as well? And does it make you a bad person if you are only interested in taking a risk that large for 
your own personal good or gain? I don't know. But what I do know is that jumping out of an airplane, a perfectly good one, without a parachute is never a good idea. But those metaphorical airplanes that we jump out of, those opportunities that we have to sort of push back the limits of what we think we are capable of, that's always worth contemplating. Our producer on this episode of LeVar Burton Reads is Julia Marie Smith. She's the best in the business, y'all. Our researcher, Lakeisha Lewis. So glad you are aboard, my sister. Editing and sound design by Justin Asher. Journeyman on the moon. And we have editing support from Tamika Weatherspoon and Harry Huggins, the new, new kids on the block. My most sincere thanks to Stephen Graham Jones for allowing me to read this fantastic story today. If you liked it, please check out his latest book, My Heart is a Chainsaw, published by Saga Press. If you like the podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and tell a friend, why don't you? Pick your favorite story and send it to them. And hey, you can hear episodes ad-free if you like and also listen to exclusive bonus author interviews on Stitcher Premium. Go to stitcherpremium.com slash LeVar to start your free trial. LeVar Burton Reads is a production of Stitcher and LeVar Burton Entertainment. Our executive producers are Josephine Martirana and yours truly, LeVar Burton. And I am LeVar Burton. You can find me on Twitter at LeVar Burton and LeVar.Burton on Instagram. LeVarBurton.com is my corner of the interwebs. I'll see you next time, but... You don't have to take my word for it. Stitcher. 